Hello there, one and all. He's Ralph. I'm Peter. So let's do this. Uh, today, we're going to talk about two things. Uh, firstly, we're going to be talking about ExxonMobil's continued pressure on ESG investors. And secondly, we'll be talking about how global supply chains are changing from being ones based on efficiency to ones based more on geopolitical risk. So in the first um, uh, with, for, for the first topic, um, at the moment, um, ExxonMobil has basically taken a couple of ESG investors on um, these e uh, because they allege that the ESG investors are pressuring them to, uh, uh, you know, do things in their business, which goes against their overall business. And um, what I mean, that's one thing. But actually, another interesting thing about this is actually the two investors that are um you know that they're taking to task in the law courts um actually don't have very big um share you know the shareholding so we're talking i think one of them has something like fifty one thousand pounds worth um of of the holding so it's not like they own a massive percentage of the company so um i think that's the main objection here or one of the main objections is that this if this works they are going to open the floodgates to loads of investors to do certain, you know, this kind of thing with actually relatively low shareholdings. Um, so that's one thing. Um, you know, this is this is potentially danger, a danger for ESG. But the other thing as well is that maybe the principles of what they're doing with the ESG um, could be applied to all shareholders. Um, so it will have much broader um, implications because for the purposes of this, it's almost like ESG is a type of activist shareholder, which they are. That's what they're kind of doing with this at the moment. So the idea is, you know, if this goes against them, that could have that could mean that all um, uh, activist investors will be restricted. But what do you think about this, Ralph? Yeah, as, as, as ever. It's it's a more multifaceted issue, isn't it? I mean, the mm. first thing is, it, it it's not actually really ESG investment as such. I mean, ESG investment is a sort of general umbrella of investing in companies which are held to perform in accordance with certain standards, held to be ethical, mm. uh, and, and we've discussed that before. And that is, of course, an entirely worthwhile uh, and, and, and valid way to to direct your investments. Um, but within the umbrella of ESG investment, there may easily lie um, a, a source of investment which is more, let's say, philosophy-based or ideology-based. And this is, I think, what we're seeing here. So I wouldn't... Uh, it, it, while it is in the context of ESG investment that we are seeing this dynamic unfold, I would use the word to describe it, which you mentioned in your introduction. I would call that activist investment. Mm -hmm. And activist investment is, of course, not a new thing. We've seen that before, where certain funds, hedge funds, have... Uh, um, have accumulated uh, sufficiently strong share positions to have a vote at the AGM in order to urge certain decisions, um, exclude members from the board, militate against the re-election of the chairman, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And while it is therefore not new to see activist investments, I think what is new, perhaps, is the the, um, the disproportionate impact which can be had through just the ownership of a few shares and mm -hmm. and i must admit i don't know exactly how this works it cannot be enshrined in the mechanical way in which this works because you only have a few votes at the AGM and no more. But I think these people are more vociferous than uh, meets the eye and they're sort of punching above their own weight in, in this way. Now, pausing here, maybe there's a bigger philosophical issue to to solve first or a bigger philosophical question 
to mm-hmm. ask first. And this is, well, some might say, well, fine, Exxon Mobile may not like this, but mm-hmm. they are owners of the company, co-owners of the company, shareholders. Mm-hmm. Should they not have a say over how the how the company is being managed? And, and this is a valid question. And, and, and I think we need to sort of think about this in uh, for, for a moment first. Um, and, and what I would say, therefore, <clears throat> is, is first of all, so what is a reasonable mandate that a shareholder of a publicly quoted company should legitimately have or could legitimately have? I would argue it is to make an investment in the pursuit of a financial return. Indeed, it is the mandate of the shareholder to maximize this return, which drives a professional investment, which is embedded in in, in funds and fund management. Now, I would argue if such a return cannot be produced through the investment of a company whose management style may not be uh, in accordance with what the investor wants, then the investor should take the money and invest it in a company where the management style is in accordance with what they want. You're, and you're what saying... they want, of course, hang on. And what they want, of course, is nothing more nefarious than the maximization of their financial return. Sorry. I, I was just going to say, this is a posh way of saying, if you don't like what you see, take your money and just go and invest it elsewhere, kind of thing. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah, sorry. I just bring well, it down to, to bring it up anyway. Yeah, go, go yes, ahead. Or only... <laughs> if you just... don't like it, just pick your money up and. Oh, I can't if say that. If you don't yeah. like it, <laughs> roll it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, only with, with a slight sort of subtle difference is <laughs> that <laughs> the, the way you described it would be mm. the dialogue between the management of the company and <laughs> yeah. the shareholders the management would say to the companies if you don't like it guess what you know yeah, yeah. whereas uh, i would say that it's the the dialogue between the shareholders and the management mm-hmm. if i don't like what i see then i take my money and mm-hmm. go elsewhere mm-hmm. this is slightly different but yeah nuanced mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. sort of essentially the same the, the net effect is the same yeah. Um, so the question is, is that actually a reasonable response or not? And I would say it is, because it, it is if you believe that a legitimate mandate or interest of the inve- of a, an investor in a company is to maximize financial return. I would say it is. That is the reason why I would invest in companies. That's the reason why most shareholders shareholders do, or most people who become shareholders do. Now, there is, of course, a legitimate question. Is it not legitimate for a group of shareholders to come together and perhaps use the holding to exert influence or pressure on management so that management could adopt a style that would lead to a maximization of return in the view of the shareholder group so that indeed they are still in line with what I just said, i.e. the mandate is to maximize return. If it can't be done by watching the management do their job, then management has to be urged to do a better job. Mm. And that, yeah, it is debatable. To an extent, I think that can be argued that that might be legitimate, but it is already pushing against the obviously legitimate role of the shareholder. Mm. I would say that in the case of Exxon, that line has been crossed. Mm. And, And the reason I say that is that Exxon is a company whose business model is to be an oil company. Its raison d'etre is to maximize profits, one hopes in an ethical way, from oil-related business. Let, let's keep it as, as loose as possible. If that particular business model, which is entirely transparent and clear to everybody, militates against the philosophical or perhaps ideological worldview of some, then I would argue that a sh- 
that the accumulation of a shareholding in that company for the purpose of changing the management style towards a style which veers away from that business model and adopts a business model which is more in line with ecological goals of that particular group, but against the original business model of the company. That is where you cross the line because mm -hmm. then the shareholder's mandate flips from return maximization towards promotion of a particular ideological view and mm. that i think and i don't know exactly where we are on this spectrum you see there is a mm. spectrum i can tell you it is legitimate if a shareholder wants to return wants to maximize returns i know where that is on the spectrum and mm. i can tell you it is illegitimate in my view if a shareholder wants to use their holdings in order to promote a particular ideological view i don't believe that is the legitimate uh, mm. role of a shareholder. So I can, I can point out, so these are the two points on the spectrum which I can identify, and the latter one has crossed the line which is somewhere else. Mm. And so from that point of view, I would answer my original question now and say that I would believe that the action of the activist investors in this particular case of Exxon Mobile which we are commenting on here, uh, is, an is adopting an illegitimate role for a shareholder. And it is therefore ethically justifiable for Exxon to go against it. And I thought this was, at least to me, and you guys, of course, have no choice in listening to me. You, you, you can switch off. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, try, there's, try there's not no to yeah, I locked yeah. the doors. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I thought it was an interesting general uh, framework into which to put our assessment here. Now, if you guys agree, or even if you don't, uh, if, if you adopt this particular framework of analysis, then it would indeed follow that uh, Exxon has a legitimate case to make and if that case turns out to be made in its favor then we will have a in case law a precedent judgment which will modify perhaps preclude similar activity or um, action of activist investors in future and to the extent that all of this has played out is playing out in the context of ESG, it might also modify the extent to which ESG investments themselves are seen to be a legitimate or appropriate way to direct investment decisions. So that is the sort of wider field in which this, this judgment, which is about to I, I believe come uh, will will sit, and so, so we need to watch this space uh, mm. and see what is going to happen. Definitely, I mean, um, you know, one one other thought. I think I mentioned this in in, in Watson's Daily was that um, maybe Exxon Mobil thinks that this is a good time to do this because ESG has been under a lot of pressure, a lot of negative press over the last year or so. Um, because you know, lots of investment managers have been greenwashing um, mm. their their funds, um, and so now that ESG, after many years of being seen as the the best thing ever, um, is now on the back foot. They see the oil companies see weakness, and they're going. For, you know, they're basically going for the jugular. So I think that this is a, it's interesting timing. We'll have to see how it goes, but you know, I think that this will have impact not only on um, ESG investing but activist investing in general. Yeah, and, and especially, especially also perhaps it will have an impact on the potential trend within ESG investment to become perhaps more extreme and veer into something which. We we could call. I mean, you guys know I like extreme sports, like extreme skiing and stuff. So mm. this is extreme ESG investment, and that mm. would be activist investment. And we know, of course, that this is happening all the time. Uh, certain things are developing, 
from a reasonable base you know there's another word very loosely defined now which is known as wokeism and to the extent that this is for example based on a general idea for societies to become more inclusive mm. not discriminatory all these ideas are of course fantastic and then it is well that they are fantastic in the, in the sense that they are legitimate and desirable uh, but sometimes the pendulum swings the other way and what we've seen uh, what we are seeing uh, are um uh, un unintended consequences as certain actions emerge which are more extreme than the original intent and as a this was just an analogy and this might actually be happening in ESG if the idea that you can promote your ideology more vigorously by using an activist investment angle takes hold mm. if it takes hold if the activist investors succeed then it would easily spread and i would say that is not going to be uh, that's going to be to the detriment of 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 the entire investment model in the first place so mm. to that extent yeah absolutely we will have to see how this goes and uh, if there is a precedent judgment to come then this would be i think very important more than in more than one way mm. absolutely so there we go. Um, okay, let's move on to the second uh, topic now. So um, there was a very good quote uh, by someone who um, was from, so the uh, Antonio Gabriel, the global economist of the Bank of America, mm -hmm. and I thought he made a really good statement when he said um, that global supply chains are gradually shifting their approach from one based on efficiency to one increasingly based on geopolitical risk management. Now, this is in regards to um, the story that Mexico has overtaken China as um, the biggest exporter to America, which is pretty amazing. Um, and this actually is the manifestation of what this guy Antonio Gabriel said, which is, um, uh, which, you know, which, which is essentially that in the past, everyone has graduated to the cheapest, <laughs> most efficient place to get their stuff. So, for instance, <laughs> um, under, uh, you know, uh, during the COVID years, um, we realized that <clears throat> China was the world's factory. Um, mm -hmm. made all sorts of things. We learnt that, um, I think it was Malaysia, but I'm sorry if I'm wrong, it might, um, is the one that had something like 60% market share of the world's production of rubber gloves for surgery. That's correct, yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and tech is predominantly, so chips um, that power everything, predominantly in Asia, in China, but very much in Taiwan, for instance. Mm. Now, um, in I, you know, I mentioned in in Watson's yearly this year um, a couple of well, a, a number of themes, but two of them that specifically uh, pertain to what I'm just saying today are the ones where we're talking about new sh uh, nearshoring and more deglobalization. Now, there's a subtle difference, I think, between those two. So what I would say is um, with more deglobalization, I'm thinking more about us thinking, well, in the past, we may have said, right, we'll get our chips from that country or that, you know, that region. We'll get our rubber gloves from this country. We'll get our this from this, you know, and you go like that. So you are using the supply of the whole world but actually what we will be moving towards is possibly more nearshoring um in the sense that um we will be looking to um bring production closer to where the end market is mm -hmm. and i think that this is happening because um there whereas in the past you might have said you know you might have t taken certain um, relations between certain countries and regions as being, you know, taken as red and everything's fine. 
But the problem is, is that, you know, the way, so with Russia invading Ukraine, with China moving away from engagement with the West and more engagement with the likes of Putin and others, suddenly what we what we have learnt over many decades may be going out of the window. And as a result of which, this is creating uncertainty, which, um, as we know, businesses hate. And therefore, um, this means that um, um, this this means that companies and industries are having to take into account geopolitical risk in more areas and more seriously than perhaps they have in the past. Um, and so uh, I think this is a really interesting subject. Um, but what do you think, Ralph? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's hugely fascinating. And I think we did discuss it already in the podcast where we talk about themes, the themes podcast, which is sort of, I think, two episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we discussed very much these, these things. And I was interested to see the chief economist of Bank of America basically elevating, in his view, geopolitical risk to one of the most important um, determinants of who to to do business with, of who to trade. So in this context, um, let me just reminisce for for a moment, if that's a word. Um, So so I'm going to go, I'm going to do a quick history since the Second World War. It's only going to to take about six hours. So (laughs) don't don't go away. (laughs) No, uh, the joking aside, it's it's going to be quick. Um, So uh, with the Second World War, a new world order emerged. And then after the Second World War, basically, we left, we we lived in a, in a, um, what's the word, in a, well, dual polar, I'm trying to, Avoid mm-hmm. the word bipolar here. Mm-hmm. So um, two poles, uh, two, two big blocks. In a, in a, in a two-block world, one is clearly the USA and, and the West, and the other one was the Soviet Union and, and the communist countries. And then uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, now in the 90s, uh, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, basically the Soviet with the Soviet Union, the communist bloc disappeared, and we had a brief moment, well, measured in a decade or maybe even 15 years, where America was the only leading bloc, political bloc country in the world, a monopolar world. And we're now moving into, I think, something which is going to be at least a tripolar world with the US Mm -hmm. and the West on one side, and then obviously a a, a reinvigorating Russia um, and uh, and China, or maybe you could say perhaps it's going to be duopolar again with China leading a consolidating block of autocratic countries in a similar way as the USA was leading a consolidated block of industrial countries. That's the sort of world into which we are moving, and I think we are solidly in this new world already. And in this new world, of course, geopolitical risk, which in itself has always existed, of course, is taking on a different shape or form. Geopolitical risk, and this is what you said, is now housed, is domiciled in countries which are different from those where we identified it before. Mm. And, And clearly, it is now... In, in Russia, we, we discussed that before, unless Russia completely changes its stance in decades to come, it is going to remain a very forcible threat to at least Europe, but by extension the world. And any business which is domiciled in the Western world is going to find it difficult to do trade with Russia at or at the very least, it's going to have difficulty persuading the board of directors in the company to actually put manufacturing facilities back into Russia because clearly the political risk is high and it is um, um, unpredictable. That's the important thing. It's unpredictable what is going to happen. Um, So if you now 
take that. And if you accept that geopolitical risk is a more important, I think, than it has been during the time that we lived in a monopolar world, perhaps uh, up to 2000, 2000 the, the noughties, and B, that geopolitical risk is taking up a different shape or form, it's now in different countries, then the decision of where to do business is going to be driven increasingly by geopolitical risk. This is exactly what the uh, uh, boss, the chief economist of Bank America said. And in the context of what we discussed, deglobalization and nearshoring, it's interesting because there is another, at least one other element which determines as countries with whom you are going to trade. And that is, in economics, I think it is known as the law of gravity. And that doesn't actually describe anything more complicated than the fact that you trade with those who are closest to you. Uh, so this is territorial proximity, nearshoring, as you said. That's the reason why um, the, the, the single market has developed, all European countries trade with each other because they are uh, in, in close proximity to each other, but also, of course, because they represent very little political risk. That is why the USA has traded traditionally more with Canada than with Australia and is now increasingly trading with Mexico. And, and that is also the reason why, sorry, I can't help myself, the decision to leave the single market was presumably based at least in part on a misreading of the global map where people thought Australia was just next to Surrey, which it isn't because it's halfway around the world. So the law of gravity clearly speaks for the single market. And before people think I'm going to be an activist investor, you know, pushing my ideology down people's, I'm going to stop. But uh, obviously, <laughs> uh, but obviously, this is the law of gravity. So if you think about some other factors which determine which economy does business with what other economy? We have two very important ones here already. One is territorial proximity. One is increasingly now geopolitical risk. Then there are some others, which is um, a heightened sensitivity to the issue of ethical manufacturing. So if you, for example, wish to put your manufacturing base into a country which uses child labor or something, uh, this has never been a good idea, but it is, well, I can't believe that people have ever thought, oh, this is excellent, you know. But maybe in past decades, people were in the interest of profit, sort of happy to ignore this. And, and mm. this is increasingly going to be no longer possible. Linking up, by the way, to ESG investments and proving mm. that ESG investments, if it doesn't lead to activist investment, yeah. is actually not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So th this is one thing. And uh, then what, what do we have? There's one other thing which I wanted to... Oh, yes. Uh, regulation. Single market again. If you have a uh, free trade agreement, any kind of trade agreement which limits the economic friction costs like tariffs, then that is another reason why you would actually do business with such a country, not with another. And in this, I mentioned four, there are some more, but in this list or skein of factors, geopolitical risk is, I think, now emerging to become one of the, if not the most important factor that determines what country is doing business with whom. Mm. And as I said uh, in the in the themes podcast, I th would not be surprised if in the in the tripolar world in, in which we I think already live, um, we are going to see the, an, an increasing number of uh, like free trade agreements or other forms of 
of, of, of treaties between countries, especially those which are territorial near to each other, mm. um, to the extent that these countries present little political risk. And I think within that particular framework of analysis, if you accept it, that would be the reason why we're seeing now Mexico overtaking China as a trading partner with the USA. Just two final additional points on this. One reason of that is, of course, that China's economy is currently in a bit of a bad shape. Uh, there, there's a risk of deflation looming. Uh, it is not contracting, but it is certainly not growing as fast as it used to be. So it is easier to overtake it, so to speak. Mm. And and the other reason is sort of like a bit of a doom-mongering <laughs> Um, look into the future. In an in another era, Trump, you may well see that another geopolitical tendency might trump. Oh, sorry, that, that was that, that was actually God, yeah, yeah, that was right. not that was not intended. Don't might worry, might dominate um, a tendency to do business with those countries which represent low geopolitical risk. And that tendency is isolationism. If America goes by the policy of America first, then it doesn't matter whether other countries represent low pro pol uh, political risk or not. He just would never do any business with Mexico if he, mm. if he, if he could. Mm. Um, so it is unclear, therefore, where the future is going to be headed but again, I would be surprised if in the long run we see more of these types of free trade, trade agreements. I think that political stability or perceived political stability is going to be one of the most important determinants of uh, in the choice of uh, who to do business with as a country. And I would say that the attractiveness of existing free trade agreements such as NAFTA in the North American continent or the single market in Europe or free uh, or the customs union, which also exists in Europe, are going to be uh, highlighted in, in, in future. Fair enough. I mean, that's one of the reasons. I mean, I think uh, it was it was last year um, where we saw um, Goldman Sachs um, launching their own institutes on that was the sole sort of reason for mm -hmm. coming um to fruition was the increased demand from clients for de um, advice on geopolitical risk and yeah. there is clearly a market for this um and and i think that you know there's going to continue to be an even bigger market because things that we have taken for granted are now can now not necessarily be what we thought and so um there will be increased need for guidance on this i think indeed uh, the, you see the trouble with geopolitical risk i think is that it is genuinely very difficult to predict mm. a geopolitical development in the future. I think it is much harder than the prediction of earnings, which of course was my bread and butter for 20 years. Hmm. And I, I don't know whether I ever mentioned this, but I, you, you, I have a short stint as a political analyst in, in the Bundestag, which is German parliament. This was ages ago. And uh, even then I thought, wow, I mean, the, the data on which I have to work here are just basically so open to interpretation. I just absolutely have no idea what is going to happen. Anybody out there who read Isaac Asimov's um, foundation novel, novels, which is, is the same thing. In, in that one, he portrayed a group of uh, professional historian predictors, and, and they were blown out of the water by developments which they could not foresee. So, for example, if you look at the Middle East uh, specifically, I think no prizes for guessing. If I was a political analyst like two, five years ago, uh, working for Goldman Sachs, for example, in the newly set up geopolitical risk uh, department, I would, of course, say, well, I mean, there's a hu huge, huge potential political risk here uh, because of the known factors 
uh, and it could explode or <laughs> like any minute, more or less. Hmm. And and look at that. It it hasn't quite exploded yet, thank God, and and hopefully it won't. But well, it has sort of exploded a little hmm. bit, if that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and the one thing which I would say to that is, even when or even after the terror organization Hamas uh, basically invaded more or less uh, Israel. And even then, it was sort of clear to everybody, I think, that this could, of course, um, ripple out into the region. But the exact way in which it is playing out now was unclear at the time. I mean, at the moment, we we have the Houthis um, endangering passing ship traffic, and we commented on this last episode, increasing inflation because of the increased freight costs. Um, But even in that particular dynamic, which we now know is happening, and which we may not have been able to predict with compelling confidence uh, in October, even that particular dynamic appears to be less pronounced than it meets the eye. Mm. Maybe you guys remember, and I'm going to do this again now, maybe you guys remember that last time I was uh, looking at the containerized freight index. Mm -hmm. And I was describing that the cost shot up uh, during the Ukraine war, then it collapsed again, and recently it shot up again, but it uh, is sort of almost at one third of its peak, of its historic peak in the Ukraine crisis. And at the time I was saying, well, I can't really see from the data here where this is going to go. Is it going to go further? Is it going to go sideways? I can now reveal that it has gone sideways. It hasn't gone up further. And I think the reason for that might be that there is now overcapacity emerging in the cargo ship sector Mm -hmm. as lots and lots of orders which were placed during the pandemic crisis um, for cargo uh, ships are coming good. And we have overcapacity in the market, and that is dampening prices while the Houthi militant activity is increasing prices. And I think that is hanging in the balance now. Who knows where this is going to go? But just as one element of how geopolitical analysis would feed into economic analysis, that's exactly the sort of thing which you would do if you were employed by Goldman Sachs in the new department. Mm. And Now, of course, it is still anybody's guess where this is going to go. Would you now invest in the region? At the moment, you wouldn't. But would you invest in um, cargo ship companies? Well, this is the sort of question. Uh, You you, you would if you thought that you can, with some confidence, predict that the the, the freight cost is going to top out and come down. Mm. But there is, of course, an element of uncertainty in this, and this is all tied up with the geopolitical situation which we have referenced and the Mm. difficulty which uh, is inherent in a prediction of these these dynamics. Mm. Absolutely. But again, you know, this is all good stuff um, and, you know, brings up a number of different themes. Like I say, these themes have been echoed in um, Watson's Yearly. So, again, I'll, I'll try, I'll be updating that um, with with this extra stuff because Watson's Yearly goes throughout the whole year and the idea is it, it's, it's supposed to update as time goes on so that you can look back at it at the end of the year. But anyway, do, do you have anything else to add, Ralph? No, just that it was my pleasure to refer to the containerized freight index again. I'm going to try to get this in every every time now. Nice. I mean, nice. This replaces inflation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talk about our, that our, our, ne- our next favorite, uh, next sort of big, big favorite subject. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> yes. Anyway. Excellent. All right. And then, well, look, um, thank you very much. As always, brilliant to talk to you. Um, thank you very much for listeners, for viewers, watching, listening. Um, and we'll be with you again very soon. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank Great, you. Thanks. Bye.